Hello, everybody. Welcome to Women and Children First virtual events. My name is H. Melt. I am the poetry coordinator here at the bookstore. And um, I would like to begin this evening's event by acknowledging the land on which Women and Children First sits is the occupied territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people of many nations living in Illinois. We, st we strive to recognize and honor native histories, literature, and communities. And we encourage you to research whose land you're on in your own homes and communities. Women and Children First is currently closed to the public for in-store shopping but we are processing online orders, doing curbside pickup and shipping books across the country every day. We're hosting many virtual events, which are all listed on womenandchildrenfirst.com, um, including an upcoming event with Adrian Marie Brown for her new book, We Will Not Cancel Us, um, which will be taking place on December 15th. So tonight I am really proud to be celebrating one of my personal favorite authors, Matilda Bernstein Sycamore and her latest book, The Freezer Door. Joining her in conversation is T. Fleischman, author of Time is the Thing a Body Moves Through. Both books are available by clicking the green button at the bottom of your screen. Um, just a little history, I first met Matilda right here at Women and Children First years ago when she was promoting the end of San Francisco. And now I've been working here over five years. Um, there's a great colorful picture of us chatting as she signed my book. But even before that, my first encounter with her work um, was about 10 years ago through the anthology Nobody Passes, which was the first trans book I ever read. And that affirmed the beauty, complexity, and politics of being a gender nonconforming person in the world. It made it possible for me to imagine myself and the life I've built over the past decade um, since I've encountered that book and many more of Matilda's books, including um, what we're celebrating tonight, The Freezer Door. So thank you, Matilda, for always offering your communities and me so much. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna bring Matilda on screen first for a reading. Thanks so much for coming and I love this chat. This is amazing just to even see people commenting before we start. It really feels like the build up to an event when we're in person. And so thank you for all your wonderful, sweet comments. Keep them going. Thank you, H. Melt, for that incredible introduction. Um, and, and yeah, just imagine me, here I am at Women and Children First and I'm reading from the freezer door. Um, I'm gonna read from page 133 in case you wanted to know. <laughs> the worst illusion of safety is safety. Two UPS trucks parked back to back. Maybe someone will write a song about this. Whenever you think your memory is not as good as it used to be, it's important to remember there used to be less to remember. One problem with humans is the chain reaction of human thought. Maybe I mean action. One problem with human action is human thought. I'm in a hotel that leads to a sex club and I see this guy I've had sex with before. The curve of his back so smooth a curve like comfort. And can looking be the same as touching? But then we're touching and it's so sweet. I reach for one of those new condoms, open it up and it's a peanut split in half. This is how dreams are made biodegradable. But then suddenly a group of straight guys arrives. Maybe it's their party and we're not supposed to be doing this here. One of them throws me down on the floor with a huge pair of scissors in his hand, ready to cut off my desire and anything it might produce. But then I twist his arms so far back, the scissors drop to the floor. I use the scissors to cut the phone cables that are tying everyone up. 
but not the phone that will get us out of here. Now the straight guys are gone. I look into a glass on an end table and the liquid inside the glass asks, how can you justify your behavior? I say, what do you mean? Could there be anything more beautiful than our bodies together like this in the room? And the liquid in the glass is embarrassed. You're right, he says. And I look around the room to figure out how it can become a room again, somewhere to hold us, how there can be enough room. Adrian calls, thanks for your message about my doctor's appointments. It felt so warm and supportive. And it reminded me that you're a consistently supportive person in my life and I shouldn't fuck with that. He wants to go back to our plan of meeting up once a week at a specific time, like I originally suggested. I'm trying to feel like this is actually gonna happen. How do you focus on a relationship if it never quite comes into focus? Now that my view is gone, I can't stop staring at the black mold growing on the frame of the new building across the street. I'd love to take a workshop on crying, but I still haven't made it to a cuddle party. I'm thinking about the body as a potential, but a potential for what? We make art from our neuroses, but do we make neuroses from our art, the transition from walling off desire to desiring walls, the way advertising collides with selfhood, and we all know who wins the lottery. Sometimes the lack of critical engagement in worlds allegedly built around critical engagement stuns me. It stuns me. I can't tell if I'm hungry or enraged? And what's the difference? I wonder if I'm the only person who still goes outside thinking someone magnificent and unexpected might happen. I walk towards the sun, stand at the bottom of the hill before the stairs to the street above the highway overlooking the skyline and watch the shifting colors of the leaves blowing in the wind. Halfway down the stairs, there's a friendly dog almost too friendly because it keeps jumping up. I didn't realize English bulldogs actually jumped, but I liked English bulldogs even before I decided to like dogs. So it's okay. Also there's the sun. So this is a different world. Flowers growing in a field, which isn't really a field, just some rocks overlooking the highway. I decide to walk up that grassy steep hill to help realign my feet so they don't hurt anymore. And when I get to the top, I have to step over a railing to get back to the street. Then there are the usual gay couples who ignore me. Someone points in my direction, but actually he's pointing at a condo. I decide to go back up that hill again. So I go down a different way and I notice someone else wearing purple pants but actually I'm not wearing purple pants. She smiles at me and then goes back to texting. There's that field of bluebells again, just past the hill I'm gonna walk up. And when I look up at the window of a building that looks redone, I see that someone is looking out, but not out. And then halfway up the hill, I realize it's not as pretty this time. Maybe it's not as pretty because I'm already thinking about writing about it. Halfway up, or maybe two-thirds of the way, the grass turns to mud and moss, and then just mud and cigarette butts. And I keep almost stepping in dog shit. Back on the street, I'm walking up the hill that usually seems overwhelming, but now it doesn't. Except that now the sun isn't out anymore, and I'm sad. Suddenly, I'm cold too, and when I get back to my block, there's some really loud noise. Maybe the construction is going on late tonight. Actually, it's someone with a leaf blower blowing allergies right into my face, and now my head hurts. There's a container of dental floss on a chair in the lobby of my building. I do need floss, but I don't think I want someone else's. 
Maybe there's nothing straighter than a gay sex club. I walk into the video room and there are five guys on the bench, naked except for towels around their waist, acting like they're just hanging out. They even have those traumatized, I'm a dude, but I'm turned on expressions. I wanna yell, girls, this is a sex club. You can have sex here. But I'm here too, silenced by the dehumanization of complicity. Three of them leave. I sit down. Then I say, why is everyone acting like they're straight? The other two guys leave without even looking at me. This is only the beginning. The difference between satire and what's going on in the world is that the goal of satire is to illuminate hypocrisy. I walk by a boarded up house and there's a real, assi a real estate sign that says exclusive. Why is it that a little depression goes a long way, but a lot of depression goes nowhere? The balance between something that's too awful to comment on and something that's too awful not to comment on. An update from the yoga boutique. Nuclear sunset pattern hot pants made of recycled plastic bottles. The tag says, dreaming in the clouds and loving the earth. One problem with the human interest story is that so often it doesn't seem interested or humane. I mean, mobilizing a personal narrative in service of a humanizing agenda is dehumanizing. The only thing worse than a baby boutique is a dog boutique. The only thing worse than a dog boutique is a dog spa. Realism is overrated, but just because something is overrated doesn't mean it shouldn't be realistic. The good thing about falling in love with the phrase is that it will not love you back. I mean, leave you. But doesn't it seem vaguely pornographic when someone you've never seen before opens his cell phone charger port to ask if you have one like it? Walking through the backside of the city, under the highway and then next to it, watching the views go by. There's one up ahead. Oh, thorns. The Amazon towers and the underbrush. An almost shack next to a 60s apartment building, next to condos, next to a fence, next to another highway entrance, next to the clouds. As long as the contrasts last, there might still be hope. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for the reading, um, Matilda. That was, was so lovely um, and so gorgeous. And, and you look gorgeous and, and your reading was just perfect. I'm so happy to talk about this book with you and, and to spend some time I'm uh, celebrating it. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to chat with you about it because I really feel in a strange way, as I think I mentioned before, that even though we wrote our most recent books with no contact, that our books in some ways are in conversation. And I don't know that there's another book that I feel that way so specifically. So I'm so excited to hear your thoughts in the freezer door. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. It was so nice to um, revisit it these last couple of days. I was lucky enough to read a copy like, a year ago or something like this. I forget when that would have been, but um, it was so nice to return to it. And I had forgotten how um, funny it is too. <laughs> you're, you're so, I mean, I know how funny you are, but I forgot how funny this book is. Um, it was really exciting to be laughing along with that and everything. Um, so thank you for that. How are you doing today? Well, I'm glad to be here. So, and with everyone in the audience, it can only cheer me up. Yeah. <laughs> I love seeing your plans. Yeah, yeah, likewise, likewise. <laughs> so um, I guess I'll just jump right into some questions um, and, and hear what you're thinking about it. Um, 
So I have one just like really direct question that I don't want to forget to ask. So I want to start off. You talk early um, or like midway through the book, you mention um, uh, uh, Sarah Schulman talking about going to the LGBT center in New York for the community meeting and thinking these are my people. And you say, I've literally never thought that in my life. Have you really literally never thought that in your life? I'm not like questioning you, but I'm like, wow. Well, yeah, no, no, that's yeah. a great question. I, mean, um, I don't know. I think I kind of have had some moments like that, but um, I was, I think I was, I was struck by that as somewhat surprising. So <laughs> I just wanted to hear if you had anything more to say about that. Yeah, I mean, going to go in a room where I don't know the people ahead of time and immediately think these are my people, I would say, no, I've never. Oh, yeah, no, you're never right. experienced that in that <laughs> Um I mean, I might be like, oh, I'm curious about this person, or I feel comfortable, or I feel uncomfortable, but I've never gone into like a room, because the, the piece, what she's saying, you know, it's it's at the LGBT center. And mm -hmm. so the idea is like, oh, these, I'm connected automatically. And I think that sometimes, I mean, when I'm walking down the street and then, you know, yeah. the person ignores me or like stares through <laughs> me, like I'm, you know, not even there or, I mean, but of course, but of course there are also those moments of commonality and connection, but in terms mm -hmm. of like, that idea of um, community as something that is automatic, I mm -hmm. think I have never really experienced that. I've yeah. wanted it, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but in rooms, of course, where I know the people and we're working on a common project, sure. But not yeah. in like a room where I just like show up. Well, actually, well, let me, let me, maybe I, well, I'll make a, a slight adjustment at a reading, but I mean, those people are there mm -hmm. for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> like if I go to a room, and I do have that feeling like, oh, wow, well, this is pretty exciting. But that's a whole different story, right? Because I already know why they're there, you know, presumably. Maybe some of them got there by accident, you know. Some library <laughs> readings, you know, like half the people might just be there because, you know, they wanted somewhere like to sit down for a little bit. But yeah. um, but generally speaking, I would say, I would hold to that line. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, yeah, that makes sense to me. The, um, I've definitely never walked into a, an LGBTQ center or whatever <laughs> and thought that too. It's, I mean, one of the reasons I think that um, struck me too, and I was reading this book and feeling really excited about the freezer door and the kind of direction you're thinking is, is going and like so many things about it. Um, and I was also reflecting on your work on whole and like what a gift it's been for me personally over the years to be reading your work and, and knowing you as a person eventually and all these things too. And just how, um, and, and each one kind of mentioned this. I remember for me, it was um, uh, That's Revolting that gave me this, um, that, that anthology, right? That like connected with me when I was like, maybe like I think 21 or so when it, when it came out and it like really, uh, I felt like was an entry point into this idea of queer as um, politicized identity and community around it and like really became um, like a direction I was moving in and this really, you know, a kind of profound way for me. Um, and so I was also really drawn to the way you think about queer and queerness um, in this book, which is um, a, again, similar to I think how I'm thinking about it now, which is um, skeptical and kind of like feeling like the connection maybe that might've been there at some point isn't necessarily there um, anymore um, and all that kind of stuff. So seeing that work through in this book was really, um, and exciting and meaningful to me as well. I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on that. Um, well, thank you, first of all, that's wonderful to hear. And um, so do you mean thoughts on that, that, that theme throughout the book? Yeah. Yeah, so I think in the book, in some ways I'm, you know, um, I'm working through the dream of queer and its failure, right? So the dream of queer as, um, an alternative to gay and straight normalcy, and also queer as beyond borders, um, beyond policing, beyond um, hierarchy, um, and also like creating our own ways of living with and loving and taking care of one another that are not predicated on dominant forms of oppression. Um, and, um, but, but really in the book, I mean, that's, that's what I would say outside the book, right? But right. in the book, what I'm working through is the embodied sense, right? And mm -hmm. so, and also the places in which, you know, we have this like incredible um, analysis, incredible rhetoric, 
incredible um, about all those things, right? About mutuality, negotiation, accountability, transformation, fluidity. Um, but in so many queer spaces, it really is one, the hierarchies are just kind of switched around, right? There's still, or, you know, there's still this similar hierarchies in some case, like about bo whose bodies are allowed to be there or similar, mm -hmm. I should say, reverse. You generally they're reversed, but there's still hierarchies, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, and then also at the same time, there is the same, a lot of the same violence that happens, like say, you know, interpersonal violence, intimate violence, mm -hmm. um, and people kind of like rationalize it with this really incredible rhetoric. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's almost like the rhetoric, or it is like the rhetoric becomes part of the violence itself. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I guess I'm just sort of circling around those contradictions. And mostly what I want to do is illuminate the gaps, right? The places mm -hmm. where like, you know, I guess the book starts in a way with this question about, um, you know, cause I was formed by radical queer worlds, you know, that's mm -hmm. what formed me, you know, and um, queers and freaks and outsiders and anarchists and vegans and weirdos and um, dropouts. And, you know, when I first like moved to San Francisco when I was 19 and found activism and found, um, just a you know a way of desire accessing a a, uh, a sense of being in public space that was how I found other people right mm -hmm. and uh, and by desire I don't mean desire only for you know sex which is great we all want that but also just desire as being part of the landscape itself so like mm -hmm. uh, to me that's that that's a queer um, ethic I think um, mm -hmm. and. But I guess I start the book in a way thinking about these same queer spaces, um, not the exact same spaces, of course, this is, you know, I'm just a few years older than 19 now. <laughs> I'm like 23, no. Um, so that was the early 90s, you know, so that's quite yeah. a while ago. Um, and, um, and so the spaces in the book, I'm in Seattle, which is where I live now. And, mm -hmm. and I feel like spaces that are radical and queer in identification, you know, are also, I guess it's always been this way, you know, like when I moved to San Francisco, I would be in queer spaces. They were mostly, you know, they were dykes and they were female socialized people who were rejecting that socialization. And then there were some fags, you know, but not that many. And everything was kind of binary then in the early nineties. So we didn't have the same, you know, there was rhetoric about fluidity, but it was, we didn't, we had not yet had our trans and gender queer moment. Um, but, but all those people were there, of course, but yeah, let's yeah. say it was like, but you know, it's mostly, um, but I think over time, mostly, you know, female socialized people. And to me that, that made sense because like gay male culture, you know, shelters so much of the violence that we were all trying to escape, you know, mm -hmm. so racism, misogyny, classism, you know, homophobia itself, <laughs> body fascism, you know, you could just go down the list on and on and on. So I was like, okay, well, I get it. And I also got that I had to prove myself worthy of being in those spaces because I was already seen as the enemy, you know, mm -hmm. just because of my body, you know, and what my socialization was. And so I had to prove it, you know, with my analysis, with the way I treated people with, and I was okay with that then because I didn't want to be in those other worlds. And I also, I understood it. And I still understand, and I feel like those worlds, while they've, the rhetoric has changed, mm. you know, like, cause the, in the early nineties, even though people called it third wave feminism, it was still binary gender feminism. You know, it was just like a different, slightly different binary. So now no queer space, queer identified space would be like, we're in favor of <laughs> the, the gender binary. That's, yeah. that's not possible, right? Yeah. Not, you know, and, and there has been, you know, a long path of like, including trans women in, um, in queer spaces, um, mm -hmm. rhetoric, I should say, that, that, that is not necessarily actualized. And people are familiar with that, right? But I think the bodies who are welcome are not that different. Um, mm -hmm. And so I guess that's one of the questions is like, these are the worlds that form me. This is my analysis. This is everything I believe in in the dream. I still believe in the same dream, but yeah. I don't know that my body can exist there because if I go in a room and I already know I'm not welcome, 
I'm welcome if they know I'm me, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But like, mm -hmm. if I'm just me as like this person, this like gender queer, you know, trans feminine, faggot queen, you know, and mm -hmm. they looking at me like, you better prove while you're here. Like when I was 19, that was okay. But now yeah. that I'm a young 47, and also that I've existed in these worlds for decades, right, and helped to create and, you know, um, that that isn't really a comfortable feeling for me anymore. Or I should say, it's not worth it. Like, mm -hmm. it's not worth being there. I don't want to be there. Yeah, so I yeah. guess one of the explorations in the book is, and I, oh, I guess I should say, so I feel like if I'm not welcome, mm -hmm. like as, and this, you know, like as someone who has, I have all the rhetoric and all the analysis and I can match any, any of the language, you know, and mm -hmm. any, like if I'm not welcome, right? That means this is huge, right? How will people access these spaces mm -hmm. if they have to, even if they have that analysis, mm -hmm. they're still not welcome because of the body they are living in and how that's perceived. Mm -hmm. And so um, while I still believe that, you know, uh, mainstream gay culture, of course, is something that we always need to work against as we, we need to work against straight normalcy, you know, and they are two poles of the same thing, right? Um, I also, in the book, what I do, it's in a way, it's an exploration. I'm going into um, spaces that I already know are corrupt in mm -hmm. order to find what isn't, because I will no longer, I no longer believe that there is a space that I could just go to that isn't corrupt. Yeah, so that's yeah. my very long. I didn't expect to talk so much about that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very long, you know, a long meandering path. I yeah, just move yeah. around a lot to just stretch. So if anyone else <laughs> wants to stretch, stretch with me. We can break the borders of this screen. Just <laughs> I can do a little. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I love yeah. that. Thank you for all that. Thank you for all that. Um, yeah, and I love that in the book. One of the um, uh kind of like companion explorations or movements right is these um the public sex the hookups with the um often like presumably or perhaps or in some crypto way straight men right so it's like these encounters with straight men that offer a sort of um like a like a short circuiting of some of those other logics in a way and these encounters with straight men that offer i forget how you say it something like the intensity of the physical um, overpowers the um, the lack of connection or something like this. I forget mm -hmm. exactly how you say it. Mm -hmm. But these are, um, encounters with people who are entirely in some ways outside of what might be seen through, like you say, the queer ethic. Um, but these other types of encounters that offer a different thing and a different form of connection and a different maybe possibility or opening there. So I love that that's part of it. And I also love how, because, um, uh, I only learned about this fairly recently, but like public sex is apparently like not okay with a lot of the the queer <laughs> ethic now. That's like that's that's like a, a bit of a you know, like you're, ooh. Um, so I love I love that this becomes a part of it and like a counterpoint to it. And I just really found a lot of, of connection there in how that was working through the book. The idea mm -hmm. of breakthrough, right, and how those things can happen. Yeah, I'm not giving you questions. I'm just kind of talking with you about that. Um, <laughs> I would I would like to hear you talk a bit because um, this isn't your first um, book that uh, labels itself as like a memoir or uh, whatever whatever labels this. I think I've heard you call this one a lyric essay. Um, mm -hmm. And your of course your fiction and all your work is I don't think really fits in there. But I wondered if you could just talk a little because the um, the sensations and the rhythms and the textures in this felt. So, um, that um, maybe my mo my favorite part of the book is the the joy of the language and how the language offers so much and how the language is moving me through here and giving me so many um, rhythmic sensations and moments of delight and insight and you know all this kind of stuff. So, um, which your work always has these things in it, but I feel like there's there's something else happening with this one. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you came to to write write in this way and why. Sure. Oh, was there a second part? No, that's it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so I, um, generally when I start a new book, I really don't have any idea what I'm doing. I just start <laughs> writing and I purposely do not impose anything on it. Mm -hmm. I just write and write and write. 
until I feel like I've arrived somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I, then I take a look at it. So in this case, it was several years before I looked at it as a whole. I mean, of course, as I'm writing, I'm, you know, I, there are things that are, I'm becoming interested in that I keep coming back to. I'm aware of that, but I'm not aware of what form it will take um, mm -hmm. or even what it is, or even whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, and so when I, so when it, the first, I don't, I didn't call it a draft, but, I, but the, I just call it the material, right? Cause I started with like a thousand pages. Mm -hmm. um, and the book now, you know, it's this very compact. It's like 200 and something, but some of the pages are like one sentence or one paragraph. Um, and, and so, and then, so when I edit, I'm editing down uh, often like thematically or, um, yeah, and so, and, or, or just like, there might be like, you mentioned the public sex. So I might've had like 200 pages of public mm -hmm. sex descriptions and then, so then I wanted to, okay, well, I want to not necessarily, it's not that I'm taking the, cause they all might be really interesting and well-written, not all of them, but it's, you know, a lot of them, but what I want to do is condense it. So I want to take it and I kept like cutting, cutting, cutting. So even like and I, something I might've had five pages, it might be two sentences. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm just like, what is the, what is going to indicate, like, I guess what I'm doing in the book is I'm writing, uh, because I'm writing toward an embodied self, I want the writing, the right, like, the text itself is creating the form, right? And so I'm moving, and embodiment, by embodiment, I don't just mean like pleasure, right? Because I also mean loss and longing and devastation and um, grief and uh, hopelessness. Like all of this is embodiment and I want, and so the text to me follows that. So like when the text breaks, it's because it can't hold any longer, mm -hmm. you know, and it can't hold my body. It can't hold itself. And I like what you said about the rhythm and the tonality of the text, because in a sense, I also, that's what, it, that's, the, that's what came, a lot of that is in the editing itself, you know, because mm -hmm. I wanted like in a way, I call it a lyric essay because it's circling around itself in search of a, an embodied truth, right? And it's broken and the gaps remain. They're always there, you know? And while I am searching for something that I hope will be resolved, I don't want to spoil it, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it may not be resolved. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But also because a lyric essay, while it is nonfiction, uh, in my opinion, um, it can incorporate all these different forms within that, right? So mm -hmm. memoir, criticism, fiction, poetry, and everything that's kind of like in between those, those, those gaps. So mm -hmm. like, you know, there are parts of the book where, you know, it just breaks and becomes a conversation between an ice cube and an ice cube tray, right? Mm -hmm. So perhaps that might not be seen as nonfiction. I don't know, but it might be, I'm not sure. Um, so, but I, so I want it to allow, you know, all of those possibilities, but also I think the ways in which the form, like one of my obsessions in the book is language itself, you know? So it has, you know, there are all these themes like gentrification, there's um, desire, there's intimacy, there's um, the hypocritical lore of gay male sexual culture, there's queer, the dream of queer and its failure, there's, uh, assimilation, there's Seattle, there's trees, there's um, lying in the sun, there's dancing, there's, um, you know, all these variety of, of themes, but um, I have no idea where I was going with that sentence. Um, <laughs> I was enjoying that I was just going on, but I can't remember the destination. But I guess maybe that's illustrative of <laughs> what I'm doing in the book itself, because, you know, because I want like, even though I edited it 15 times, you mm -hmm. know, from start to finish um, and started with a thousand pages, I want, I edited to keep the spontaneity intact. Mm -hmm. So that's of course a paradox, but I feel like I interest, that's why I love editing because you can make your text more spontaneous in my mm -hmm. opinion. Like, but I, so I had to keep the voice and I wanted to keep that sense of not knowing where I'm going. Mm -hmm. um, even though, you know, obviously by the time I'm editing it 15 times, I have some, I have more of a sense, but mm -hmm. I still want that in the text itself. And mm -hmm. I think that 
that also to me, that that is that lyric quality. Um, and also that that exploration that the book, in, in a way, perhaps, and I didn't think of this until very recently, <laughs> but I was like, maybe the most successful embodiment in the book is actually the text itself. You know, the, the act of creating the text that remains in the text um, that you're reading. So that, that, that's something I've been thinking of recently. Yeah. Well, and like the embodied connect, you know, it's like an embodied reading experience too, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like a kind of embodied connection that comes through that in, in a certain mm -hmm. way as well. I am the, like you, like we're saying the textures and the rhythms and the surprises of it, um, the, like there's these little moments like um, kicking the pine cone, right? Or like when you're dancing and then someone else joins in the dance or the sunlight's hitting you so you're taking the clothes off and you're dancing on the street. And these little kind of surprise moments that mm -hmm. um, within the rhythm of the book, especially as a reader, I'm kind of like drawn to um, all that. You know that um, you're free to do what you want? You know that song? <laughs> yeah. I remember this. Um, I was dancing to that last night, um, and I like didn't even at the time. I was like, "Oh, this came to me because of the book," and it like brought me to this place of ecstatic dance. <laughs> but yeah, there, I, I do think there's an embodiment in the text that's really, really lovely and important too, for sure. Do you? Can I ask? Oh, are we? Yeah, I'm gonna ask you one, one more question. If that's okay. Please. Yeah, absolutely. Are you? Um, and it, tell me if this is fair to ask. Can I ask what the, um, how the um, cruising and all this and the public sex has changed for you over the past with the pandemic? Or is that not a topic that you'd like to? Oh, know? well, I can answer that. That's a, that's a, that's, <clears throat> I mean, it's interesting. Well, so I would say the book, right, is searching for a particular, uh, basically, I guess what you were saying just now, I think one of the things I wanted to add is sort of, to me, that's the dream of the city. And this is something I say in the book, right? The dream of the city is that you will find everything and everyone that you never imagined, right? Yeah. Of course, we go there to find what we did imagine, but really the reason, in my opinion, to be in a city is to those unexpected moments, that person or that moment, and it could be a moment with the person, it could be a moment with the building, it could be a moment mm -hmm. with the light, you know, even the trees, right? The trees in an urban environment, but it's that density of urban experience and, in Seattle, and what I'm writing against is this wall, you know, which is the the suburban, the tyranny of the suburban imagination in the urban environment, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm in Seattle, where is a pinnacle of that, but like it's everywhere now. It's all of our gentrified cities, and mm -hmm. um, and so, but I think if there's a postscript to the book, because of course, you know, a book when I when I wrote this book, it's in the present, of course, but like mm -hmm. the present. The, well, and it's an interesting thing. I'll, I'm going to add one other thing, which is that I thought when this pandemic started, um, I was like, oh, well, are people going to relate what, to this book? Because it's like, it's everything changed in a certain, especially about embodiment or touch or mm -hmm. public space, everything, right? And what's been really interesting um, is that I actually see that people relate more because... Yeah. I think before when I'm talking about alienation and loneliness, um, I feel like obviously some people are gonna relate, but mm -hmm. now I feel like everyone relates. I mean, everyone always feels, you know, everyone always knows those feelings, but they don't necessarily name them, right? Mm -hmm. And now everyone's got it, right? Because like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so I would say the postscript to the book is, is where I really started to feel like connection in an embodied way it was through, I mean, dancing has always been the way that I have felt the most, it's when I feel the most alive, but I just kept coming, and go, you know, I would go to clubs, you know, I was like a, you know, club child, like way in the back. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, I have devastating chronic health problems and everything about those spaces is not for me, right? I would still try, I mean, we danced a few times mm -hmm. in one of these bars that's mentioned, you know, in the, in the book, what mm -hmm. the central one, Tony. Yeah, um, yeah. But like, there was always something that would devastate me. But I started to go to ecstatic dance and contact improv. And I was like, like, I feel like really felt like, well, cause these spaces, you know, no one's smoking, no one's high. Mm -hmm. No one's like trying to fuck you over in order to fuck, you know, to, well, not me, I guess. I mean, some people are trying to do that, of course. But, uh, 
<laughs> but the environment is so weird. And but it's like once I got used to it, it really like I could have touch in a mm -hmm. uh, in an intimate way in everyday experience because that's what I want. It's mm -hmm. not like this like one true love or that yeah, like yeah, yeah. hot sex or I mean those things are you know I'll take. But like I want it in everyday experience. Like I want touch to be part of my world all the time, you know? That's mm -hmm. when I feel the most present. And so let's say like right before this pandemic, I was like, oh, I think I have like 50% of that touch. And that was like really, I mean, you know, I probably I started at like 10 or something, right? Mm -hmm. And and then boom, it went to zero, yeah. you know? And, um, and that's where I am now, <laughs> <laughs> more or less, with a very few exceptions. Yeah, but, yeah. So basically, you know, I'm living this, you know, so that's my, that's what the main, the main shift for me. There are, you know, a few exceptions here and there, but yeah, but it's yeah. pretty, pretty close to zero. Yeah, so yeah. it's an, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's not yeah. what I would have imagined, but yeah, um, yeah, here we are all together experiencing, you know, different yeah, versions yeah. of this. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Oh, I think, oh, I think. Do we, go to, um, do, we, do we go to questions from the audience? Yeah, no, let's take it. Bring it on. Do we do that? I see there's ask a question. Do you want to look it in there? Oh, yeah, there's three and ask a question. Thank you. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Um, uh, should I just read? Uh, I'll just read these. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll look. Um, my students and me have been talking about Jack Judith Halberstam's concept of queer time and a queer time and place. I'm wondering how you thought about time temporality and its relationship to trans queer identity in your work. Perhaps you didn't think that literally about time, but it's quite clear the forms and content and its subjects in both texts reflects the time that is resistant or otherworldly in imagination and temporality and its many institutions. So yeah, how are you thinking about time in the book? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a, actually a good question. I um, So time in the book, like I said, it is taking place in a present, but the present is always, um, like I guess I would say, the present is not the present I want, right? And so the present is also, like in the part, mm -hmm. the part that I just read, maybe that's the, where the question came from, right? So dreams take place um, and uh, the dreams just kind of meld with the present, right? And so, and also, you know, I don't, um, I always do this, but maybe even more so in this book where, you know, time is not linear, right? And um, time is just, you know, it moves from paragraph to paragraph, we might be in a different space, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so it follows, uh, I guess, the experience of the world. And also sentences are also circling around one another. So where I might be, you know, walking, a lot of it is walking around the experiences that happen. Um, but I feel like for me, I guess I do want to blur those boundaries between past, present and future. Um, not just to blur them, but because they're always blurred in our lives, right? Like mm -hmm. I walk down the street and then boom, here comes this memory, you yep. know? And I don't write it like that in the book, but you know, or like it, like someone, uh, Derek uh, McCormick, uh, uh, wait, did I just get it? last night asked um, this question about this one thing I talk about wearing a coat that flares like the sound of music mm -hmm. and a red coat. And he's like, is there a red coat in the sound of music? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the feeling is a red coat, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's that like, you know, in a field, right? And that's the big memory. You're in a field and flaring. And, and so, so I do want my writing to cross those borders. Mm -hmm. um, because I do feel like that is a more, at least for me, a more honest way of thinking about the world. And also I should say trauma freezes us in, in time, right? So mm -hmm. like in the past, usually in the past or the present, perhaps in the future, like I guess that's what hope is. <laughs> it's like trauma in the future. Um, but like, I feel hopeful, you know, like, I feel very hopeful. <laughs> uh, but like, but more the, you know, the past, you know, would be, you know, childhood trauma, which I've had a lot of, you know, the, pre mm -hmm. you know, so I feel like in order to get out of that trauma, part of it is not allowing us to get stuck. Maybe, I don't know, I'm just thinking this now, but 
maybe part of that is not getting stuck in linear time, you know, and also not getting stuck in the imposition of narrative. Like in my books, I want the narrative comes through the text itself, not the other one way around. I don't want to impose anything. I want to allow the text to become something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the dreams, you know, you start off with this, um, you know, one line about gentrification, and then we go straight into this, like, kind of breaking into a dream space, too, right? So, like, I think of this as, like, dream spaces and dream logics, too, and the kind of reordering of time that, like, you're talking about, or, like, the experiencing of time in these ways is also, like, one potential way to at least start to, like, think our way out of some of these other problems the, the book is is looking at right like towards the end of the of the freezer door you you turn towards writing more explicitly and are saying how you know like, like you were saying earlier kind of how writing might offer some of these connections or writing might offer some of some of these things and the kind of like ability of, of language and of writing to move in these ways and to get something down that i have trouble um necessarily it's harder to get down i think um in other ways but in the language to me i can i can make sense of it or see it a bit more and that these breaks or these openings can offer so much for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me give us another question. Um, can you tell us more about your intention to leave um, blank space on the page? Uh, yes, absolutely. So for me, oh, was that the end of the question? You yeah, it, should, I read yeah the whole, okay. should I read the whole thing? It's, uh, oh, there the, more, yeah. The book is stunning and beautiful. The first few the pages, pages are beautiful. beautiful. Can you tell us more about your intention to leave? space on the page and did you have to fight for it in the publishing process? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, luckily, I did not have to fight for that in this publishing process, so mm -hmm. thank you. Just send me a text. Um, but the blank space, I did have to fight for a few things, but not mm -hmm. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the blank space for me, so the book opens with one sentence. Mm -hmm. And the sentence is, one problem with gentrification is that it always gets worse. And for me, gentrification is the landscape in which um, the book takes place, right? And so I wanted to set that. I don't want to explain it necessarily, but then you open, then the next page um, is, um, one problem with gentrification is always this. But then I go into a Hooters and it's a vintage clothing store. A friend of mine is trying on breasts. This is why I like dreaming. So, mm -hmm. For me, I want, the reason that the blank space exists is because I'm breaking, kind of what I said before, where the text can't, can no longer hold is one reason, but all the other reason is, is emphasis, of course. And so mm -hmm. I want that sentence to sit there. And it's actually been great because I did not expect this, but that sentence, like all the reviews, almost all of them, they, they mention it, they get it, and they get that immediately. And so that's amazing because I did not expect that. But, mm -hmm. um, but basically it says two things, emphasis or that the feeling becomes too overwhelming and it has to break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, another, another question, what, uh, for both of us, what surprised us about writing our books in the, in the writing of our books and then what surprised us about um, each other's books? Um, <laughs> um, well, I can say, I'll answer the first one. When mm -hmm. I read um, Two Fleischmann's, oh, wait, I have to take this throw lozenge out of my mouth. Um, what surprised me, I was like, I have not read another book um, by someone on the trans feminine spectrum who is exploring similar ways of sense and sexuality and sensibility and intimacy and, um, on the page, period, ever, you know? And so when I read Time is the Thing, A Body Moves Through, I was like, wow, there are all these, it's not even, occasionally the cities are the same, Occas you know, we're like separated by about 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's just that embodiment or that quest, right? And mm -hmm. also the way, the relationally, um, that feeling of, how can I exist in a body that is mine um, in a world like, you know, trans femininity is not allowed in the world that we're, you know, inhabiting. And mm -hmm. our quest is different and where it goes is different. And the forms that we're taking are different. But I still think the textual 
um, that textual experience of of searching for embodiment in the text, in in these bodies, whatever they are that we inhabit in our different ways, in all of their specificity. That that I was like, you know, I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> So that was the thing that surprised me um, about your work. Do you want to say that, answer that part, and then we'll go to the other side? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah I mean, I found all these things um, so exciting and surprising um, in, in yours also, and I had a very similar um, reading experience. I One thing that really, this I mean, I don't think this is like the most surprising thing, but it's just what strikes me right now and really um, sticks with me. You. Talk, and it's early on, you're like, go. The, one of the like um, inciting events or whatever, right? Is you going to the pony um, and uh, meeting people and stuff. And this idea that you had to go um, and like look for faggots to connect with. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and, like this is in like this stuff was the way where I was like, oh my God, this is like at some point in my life, things have like shifted in such a way where to have faggot friends, I largely would have, would have to go and like seek the like seek this connection. Yet this like contradiction, which is what we're kind of talking about, right? We're also like, um, we are faggots and are like then also excluded for being faggots, but then we also uh -huh. have faggots, you know? And like, and you talk, there's also this way, there's like the, um, you're, where you're talking about um, gender and sexuality where it's like you're, Sexuality, you, you can be like sexualized in some spaces, but then that has to negate this other thing. And also, this way you get at like, at, like uh, an inability to, or not inability, this is the wrong way to say it, but um, we're taught right now to think of gender and sexuality as different things and mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. reality that, that maybe actually they're the same thing in my experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, finding the, these moments and these things where I'm like, oh, I didn't even necessarily put the pin on this for myself, but finding finding the, those revelations. And like such a like you're saying too, it's it's just such a joy to have those connections through through a text when they're so you know, I don't really encounter that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what surprised you in your writing of your own book? Oh, um what surprised me? Um <clears throat> I don't know. I, I'm I feel like I always am writing towards surprise. Yeah. So probably everything uh, but <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm, let me. I'll come back to that one. Anything you want to know? I do think yeah. we have a few questions. But yeah, any, what surprised you the most? Yeah, I don't. I, I'm not having. I feel. I'd like your answer. I'm gonna steal it again. Uh, yeah, I feel like I want to write towards surprise. I feel like if I'm being surprised by what I'm writing, then it's good. And if I'm not, then it's usually. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. I like that. I agree too. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Should I? We're we're reaching time. I don't know if I should. Let's do a quick. I'll try a quick answers. I'm not good at quick answers. In case someone noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Let me give you some quick questions. In, or do you want to just do it? Let me see. Um, I'll just, just give me it. I'll see if I can give. I'll see what happens. Um, we have a few. We have uh, time for a few more. Cool. It does in the chat. In addition to, thank you. In addition to touching everyday life, what's your delicious vision of the urban environment absent the tyranny of the suburban imagination? And hi, this is Alyssa from the Dodie Workshop. Oh, I didn't catch the last part. Uh, and hi, this is Alyssa from the Dodie Workshop in San Francisco. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, my, um, I think my vision of the urban environment without that suburban imagination is where we actually interact in public, right? You see someone on the street, mm -hmm. you say hi. You see someone that's doing something a little weird and you inquire about it. You wanna get involved in that weirdness, right? You see mm -hmm. um, someone that is in, looks like they might be in danger, you engage with them. You know, you um, see something beautiful and you become a part of it, right? And so I guess my vision is like that we allow ourselves to dream you know, um, beyond expectation, you know, and that we don't give in to our fears, right? Like what, again, like, or, you know, cause fear can be a useful thing if we take a look at it. Like I always say, you know, I write what I think that I'm gonna, if there's something I feel like I might die, if I say it, that's mm -hmm. what I need to say. That's what I need to write so that I don't die. And I feel similarly about 
you know, existing in public space, like that's how I can live, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I can't live in a strip mall or in a, um, in that mentality, right? Like I, I can't live with like gates around everything, mm -hmm. ev like everyone's way of existing. So I think it's that world without those gates, without those borders, you know, without that, um, without the fear becoming the mode of existence. Mm -hmm. And the rationalization for all of these like horrifying, you know, like people be like, I'm afraid of like crime, but there is no crime. So get over it. You know, <laughs> I'm afraid that like someone's gonna like attack me on the street. Well, they didn't. So let's just stay in the present, you know, and figure out a way. Yes, there will always be violence, but how do we create a way that we can um, transform the everyday into um, a way of interacting with one another that isn't predicated on like creating these walls. Okay, I said I was gonna give a short answer. Okay, but creating these walls, creates this, it creates the violence. So I want a world where we can actually interact with one another in all of our complication, messiness, uh, beauty, and weirdness, and um, and do that all the time, right? Like whether it's sex on the street or whether it's like, you know, kissing someone you just think is hot in the moment or whether it's like going on a walk with someone you just, you know, you're still like, oh, you look interesting, what are you doing? Oh, let's go on a walk together, you know, or like, oh, you're window shopping too. Let's have a conversation, you know? Or like, mm -hmm. oh, you're getting wet in the rain. Do you like that? Is that fun? Oh my God, let's do it, you know? Like, or mm -hmm. you're dancing in the street. Let's all dance in the street. So that's my vision, I think. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Are you still doing your, your yelling? Are you still doing your yelling? Oh, I missed that part. What did you say? Are you still doing the yelling in the evening when the um, yelling out your yelling out the window? Oh yeah, every day at eight p.m., everyone's mm -hmm. welcome to join me. I go out on the street and I yell "Black Lives Matter," abolish the police, and then I blow a whistle for a few minutes, and some of my neighbors join me. And you're welcome to join me if you are in Seattle. It's at Boylston Republican. If you're in your homes, do it everywhere. Keep it going. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so yeah, maybe we have time to take one more question. Oh, everyone, we're supposed to point out this link by the books. Take it. Oh, yeah. But anyway, keep going. Okay, well, <laughs> the order of the question. Support women. See, because we want to support women and children first. That's what. Yes, exactly. And thank you to women and children first. For, for but yeah, let's take one more question. Or if you want to like throw them all together, or I could, let's see. Let me take, should I look at them? Um. Does, uh... Oh, I love it. Meaning, yeah. but also around. Can you speak to how naming, not naming, and playing with context lives with you in your daily life? Oh, say that again. Can I speak to how naming and not naming? Mm -hmm. And playing with context lives with you in your daily life? Naming and not naming. And playing um, with context. Oh, say that again. And playing with context. Okay, so naming and not naming and playing with context. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, it's um, in my daily life, I guess what it is, is uh, I've spent a lot of time in Seattle, interestingly, with the trees. Mm -hmm. um, because the trees in Seattle are like, you know, they just, you know, there's a huge thing growing up between buildings. And, uh, and also in this pandemic time, without touch, like touching the trees is mm -hmm. I, something I, I enjoy even more. It also evens out my body and like allows me to like spread out a little more. But so I think maybe that's a way where like if I see a tree, I would just wanna lean against it. If I wanna stretch on the ground. And so I guess in a way that is also that, that in between space, you know, like people, it's amazing. People look at, I'm like leaning against a, a hedge you know, mm -hmm. or like dancing, you know, like lean and like, whoa, you know, and people will be like, literally, I mean, they look at me like, like the worst thing that ever existed. <laughs> this happens every day, multiple mm -hmm. times, you know, and sometimes the same people. I'm like, you saw me doing this yesterday. <laughs> so I, guess, I guess the key for me is 
yeah, and this is maybe a perfect way to end, but like the key is not to give in to that. Um, like, I think that, um, that silencing, right. And that, mm -hmm. like, um, that, that the way that people look at you for doing something just a tiny, 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 tiny bit out of the ordinary or the way you look or whatever, but they look at you like they want you to die, you know, get away that you don't exist or that you're too much. It's all at once. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we can't give into that, right? So I feel like wanting to create more of those moments, you know, like I've tried, what I'm trying to do in the pandemic moment, because people are even weirder, they'll be like, whoa, person. <laughs> They're like, whoa, you know? And I get it because, you know, there is this danger that we're all living with, but we're also like outside and 20 feet away from one another. So it's like probably not too dangerous. But like, but for me, when I see those things, I just try to bring it a little larger. So I'll be like, hello. <laughs> or I'm like leaning against a bush and I'll just like, let me just make it bigger, you know? Mm. So I think if we could just make these moments bigger and weirder and stranger and more glorious, then we could all live more um, expressively. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, I think maybe that's a perfect place to end. I feel like this has been such an amazing conversation with you and such an honor. And I'm so like, this, the crowd tonight, I just want to give a round of applause for the crowd because everyone was like lighting up the comments while we we're in the green room. You may see I have green wall too. Um, but uh, just like even before we started and also one joy I, I would say about these virtual readings, um, because obviously, you know, ideally I would want to be in the room with everyone and I would want to be chatting and, you know, like exchanging, um, you know, just meeting new people and seeing friends and, and talking about the book and giving each other hugs and kisses and whatever. But like one great thing is like, you know, so many writers from all over the place come to these readings. And, you know, I was just like, as we were starting, even before we were starting, it's like, it just feels like, like a, like a, um, that feels like an embrace of its own, you know, just to be in a room, even if it's a virtual room, you know, with so many, um, like-minded, you know, thinkers who are who are living this weird life. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> yes, exactly. I feel the same way. And thank you for for sharing with us and for for everything you've given us and for this book and and all the gifts it's going to continue to give us over time. I can't wait until I get to um, walk through the park with you again um, sometime in the future. Absolutely, I can't wait for that. Oh wait, I see people are reminding me about my tour. I should say oh, yeah. I am on a book tour. And I have two more events coming up next week. Um, so on Tuesday, I'll be at the San Francisco Public Library in conversation with C.A. Conrad. And then on Wednesday, I'll be at the Poetry Project in conversation with Maggie Nelson. So obviously both of those events are gonna be amazing. Oh, and I should say every reading, I always read a different excerpt. Um, and always because there's so many amazing, dynamic, uh, wonderful, you know, people like you, T. Fleischman, who I'm in conversation with, that we always have this amazing conversation. So tell your friends, you know, I'm I'm so actually grateful that like people are reading this book and engaging with it, like on such a deep level already. So thank you so much and support women and children first. If you don't have the book yet, feel free to buy it with this little link, um, buy it for your friends, you know, whatever, throw it in the air, uh, mm -hmm. play with it. <laughs> 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 and um thank you for supporting us it's been amazing being oh and always anyone who wants to be in contact with me my info is on my website feel free to reach out i love seeing these comments thank you all <laughs> 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 thank you women and children first yeah